Welcome to our review of a Flip and Write Reverse Dungeon Crawl board game, Doodle Dungeon. Thanks Pegasus Spiel for sending us a review copy of this game to check out. Doodle Dungeon was designed by Ulrich Glum and features the fantastic artwork of John Kowalik, best known for his Dork Tower comic and work on the Munchkin card games. This is a flip and write game for two to four players with games taking at least an hour. Now, my copy of Doodle Dungeon comes from Pegasus Field, who published it in 2020. This game features a very reasonable MSRP of $29.99 US. In Doodle Dungeon, players become owners of a brand new dungeon, a dungeon that happens to be empty and which needs to be filled up with things like walls, monsters, traps, and treasures. Players draft cards to add features to their dungeons, as well as building up their arsenal for when the heroes attack. The path these heroes take is determined by your opponents, so you'd better be clever when building. Once the heroes' paths are set, you play through a series of encounters, finding out how well the heroes fare. Will your monsters and traps defeat the invader, or will they get away with their lives and your precious treasure? For a look at what you get with a copy of Doodle Dungeon, check out our unboxing video on YouTube. So Doodle Dungeon comes in a surprisingly large box, much bigger than I expected when first looking at the game online, right? I purchased a lot of games online and when doing research, I just expected a small, tiny, portable box, and it is not. Now, this box features a significantly large player sheet, and that's what takes up all the room. It's what you're going to be drawing on. And there was a thick pad of these. I did not count how many are in there, but there's probably at least 100, if not two or 300. Now, this map sheet or player board or player sheet, I don't know what you call them in a flip and write. They're not really boards. Their player sheet features a significantly large grid with lots of room in each square. And the reason for that is so you can draw the various dungeon features. Now, above that is an area for tracking upgrades you've done to your dungeon. Now, the rules are very clear and concise, feature a great summary of play on the back. You also get something they call the Double, which is supposedly a legal document telling you the dungeon building rules, which just details the drawing restrictions. The game also comes with hero meeples, 2D10, sorry, 10-sided dice, four 10-sided dice, a deck of cards to draft from a score sheet pad, also used for hiding treasure, pencils, an eraser, uh, and a start player pencil sharpener. One thing I totally didn't expect was also a scent of stencils that you can use while doing the drawing part of the game. Now, I have compl no complaints about any of the components here, and I do appreciate when a writing-based game comes with everything you need, including sharpeners and an eraser. We always applaud games that provide those tools when needed in a game, and the fact that the sharpener is also the first player token is just icing on the cake. Agreed. Well, now that we have an idea of what you get in the box, how about you give us an overview of how to play Doodle Dungeon? All right, so a game of Doodle Dungeon is played over three phases. The first phase, everyone draws their dungeon, which is done by drafting cards, then drawing the features on the bottom of the cards onto your dungeon sheet. Now note, these same cards are also gonna be used later when trying to defend your dungeon. So watching what a card does, as well as what features are on it, is a big part of the strategy in this game. Now, dungeon features include walls, monsters, which come in three types, goblins, orcs, and dragons, traps, treasure, and dungeon upgrades. Each of these have their own placement rules, like you can't cut off an area of the map with your walls, and the fact traps and monsters can't be orthogonally next to each other. Now, treasures are hidden in your dungeon. Instead of drawing them, you write down where they are on your score sheet. Now, each treasure needs to be guarded by a monster, or it's lost even before the heroes show up. Though you can place a treasure on your map with plans to put a monster there later. You don't have to have one before the other. Now, dungeon upgrades are tracked at the top of your sheet and include leveling up the various monster types, making your traps more deadly, improving your treasure's value, and increasing your hand size for the final phase. So everything except the cards is right there on your sheet? Yes, it is. And well, the double, in case you forget the rules. You can't forget the double. That's an important document. Now, the next phase has you passing your dungeon to the player on your left. Then everyone is going to draw the route the hero will follow through that dungeon. You start at the entrance and you draw a path, which eventually leads to the exit. Now, while drawing this path, there are a few rules, like you can't move over the same enemy twice in a row. You have to hit a trap or something else first. And you can't enter in an individual square on the map more than twice. 
And this is a very important rule to remember when drawing your dungeon in the first phase. While it can be tempting to just draw the most direct path from the start to the finish, dodging all the monsters if you can, each monster you kill and treasure you find removes points from your opponents. You want to get as much as you can. So what stops the heroes from looking at that information recorded at the top of your sheet to see what you've done? So nothing. Um, all the information about the dungeon is public knowledge. And using that knowledge is key to drawing a good path. You know what level the monsters are. You know how much the treasure's worth. You know how much damage those traps are going to do. The only thing you don't know is where the treasure actually is on the map, but you do know how many treasure chests there are. So the use of the cards is the only real unknown then. Yeah. Now, in the final phase, everyone gets their dungeon back, and you take turns running the heroes through the dungeons. On a player's turn, they're just going to take the meeple and trace it to the next feature on the map, then play through that encounter, and then play passes to the next player, and you keep going around. Now, most encounters are going to be battles between the heroes and the three monster types. Now, battles are resolved by rolling 2d10 and adding the number to the strength of that monster, which is part of one of those upgrades, and that's set during the drawing phase. You're hoping to get a total of 20 or more, which case you will damage the hero. Now, the actual amount of damage done to the hero is set by the monster type. Goblins only do one damage, dragons do three. Similarly, there are different stats for things. So goblins start at plus zero, whereas dragons start at plus four on those dice rolls. So remember, you're the dungeon owner here, or, here, mm -hmm. or owner here. So this is this so-called hero is an invader <laughs> on your turf, a trespasser. So don't feel bad for roughing them up. Very true. Now, after rolling, if you haven't hit 20 or better, you have the option to play cards from your hand, which is something that you draw them at the start of your phase, and the number of cards is based on your upgrades. Now, these cards include all kinds of fun things like weapons, bombs, potions, and more that can modify or let you reroll dice. This is your main die roll mo um, mitigation, your randomness mitigation in the game. Now, after any modifications, if you still don't have 20, the hero defeats the monster, and they're crossed off on the map. Sadly, these are well-trained and equipped trespassers, so it's not always easy to send them packing. Now, in addition to buffing the stuff in your own dungeon, there are also cards that can buff the heroes in opponent's dungeons. You can play these on your turn, and they'll affect the opponent on their next turn. Now, to keep things fair and to stop players from ganging up on someone, each player can only have two of these cards in front of them at any one time. Now, instead of requiring a die roll, Traps just do set damage based on how much they've been upgraded. Once a trap's triggered once, it's crossed off. Now, if you manage to defeat the hero invading your dungeon, they have a health track at the bottom of your sheet, you stop having encounters, but your turn still happens and you can still play those hero buff cards if you have them. Now, the same goes if your hero escapes. You still get to take your turn every turn until all heroes have either been defeated or escaped. So you can buff any hero in any dungeon, though, of course, you wouldn't want to buff the hero in your dungeon. Technically, I think that'd be against the rules. But yeah, there is absolutely no reason to buff up your own hero. Now, at the end of the game, you just tally up your scores. Everyone's going to get points for what monsters they have left based on the type. Goblins are worth the least points. Dragons are worth the most. You're also going to get point for every treasure that's still guarded in your dungeon. Again, the value is set by how much you've improved them in the, the upgrading phase. Now, five bonus points are awarded for anyone who manages to defeat their invading hero, and players who the hero escape lose points equal to the amount of hit points the hero still has left. Player with most points wins. So now that we've got an overview of how to play Doodle Dungeon, what did you think of the game overall? All right, I got to start by saying I love the theme of this game. I am a huge fan of the reverse dungeon crawl theme, which I first experienced through the PC game Dungeon Keeper. This is the, the theme where you're playing basically the bad guy, building the dungeon and trying to defend it from invading heroes. One of my all-time favorite board games, Dungeon Lords, is a great heavy euro with this theme. And at the opposite end of the scale, I also really dig Mo Boss Monster, which is a nice quick filler game that shares this theme. This is why I jumped at the chance to check out Doodle Dungeon when the offer came up. Though I think calling the players villains or bad folk is a bit strong. <laughs> They're just defending their property and items from an invasion. What's wrong with that? Oh, nothing at all. Nothing at all. There's no evilness going in in any of these dungeons whatsoever. We're just peaceful overlords. So what I can't help do but is compare Doodle Dungeon to these other games, right? These are games in my collection that I really dig. 
And well, I got to say, it's like the three bears because it's somewhere right in the middle between Boss Monster, the light filler game, and Dungeon Lords, the heavy Euro. And I got to say, I dig it. That said, it did surprise me in, in some major ways. Because with this silly theme, the John Kovalik art, I expected this to be a light filler game. I expected a different boss monster, something different. A boss monster rolling rate, right? I expected rapid card play and lots of take that. And that's not what we have. Instead, we have a game that's actually closer to Dungeon Lords. This is a longer game with a lot of strategic elements and very difficult decisions on the part of the players. Which leads me to the biggest issue I see with this game, and that's people having the wrong expectation. I know I did, and I worry other people will as well. Personally, when I hear flipping right, I don't expect a medium light game with an hour plus playing time. Even the name Doodle sort of gives a light, relaxing sort of feel. Mm -hmm. And while the playtime is listed on the box, I think the overall feel of the design can easily make people overlook that. Totally agree. Now, now that I know what to expect when sitting down to play Doodle Dungeon. Because that first game, when we sat down with Kat, Corey, and Dana, we were a little surprised. I actually was like, here, we're going to dive in, and I'm not going to teach the rules because we're going to play two or three times in a row. Well, that didn't happen. But now that I know, and I can set that expectation that, hey, this is a longer game. You're going to play 14 rounds of drawing, and then you're going to do this and do this. It's going to take like an hour. I have had some really enjoyable game nights playing this reverse dungeon crawler. Now, the rules are very concise and very well designed though i gotta say it takes a player or two to learn how you should be drawing your dungeon versus how you can this is a huge strategic element of the game the things you choose your first card draft is going to affect everything going forward because your card is not only being used for drawing you're also using it to defend your dungeon later and there are lots of different strategies you can try like you get 14 rounds to draw. That gives you plenty of time and features to add and lots of chances to pivot your strategy tactically if the cards aren't coming up or if you notice someone else is taking a lot of a certain type of card. And I got to say, every time I played now, there's always someone who doesn't like taking walls at the beginning and spends the last few rounds going, please give me walls, please give me walls. All in all, this is a much more nuanced and thoughtful game. Yes. Don't let the silly artwork fool you. I totally agree. Now, I particularly love the element of this game where the cards you draft become your defense deck. That is just really neat. That's just, in a way, in a way brilliant. Because this is something so easy to overlook your first couple games, but can become a big part of your strategy. Grabbing a card with stuff you may not really want to draw because you really want that bomb or that curse tote card or that dragon's breath is pretty standard in this game, trying to decide what to grab. Similarly, knowing the path drawing rules can really impact how you draw your dungeon. The key rule being the one I mentioned before, where you can en only enter each square twice. You can use that to your advantage to present your opponents with difficult path choices, possibly cutting off large sections of your dungeon and keeping those valuable treasures protected. I believe once you nailed that particular rule about path generation, your wife spoke out rather vocally about your success in implementing it. Yes, cross-shaped patterns are good, is the only hint I will give. Remember, you can only enter a square twice. Now, one of the aspects that makes this game so long to play, though, is the drawing part. Not everyone draws with the same level of skill, or more importantly, in this case, speed. And I've got to say, I really appreciate the stencils. They can really speed things up. Drawing a goblin with that stencil is way quicker than trying to draw an orb and ears and face on it. The problem is convincing people to actually use the stencils. Now, I have to admit, while waiting for other players to finish drawing, I've often wondered how much quicker the game would be if we just use symbols or letters. Like shade in a wall quickly, put a T for a trap, a G for a goblin. I'm certain this would speed things up, but then it removes the drawing fun and you pretty much throw away the whole dungeon theme. It's a tricky balance to fit in that time versus decoration balance. Yeah. Uh, after all, roguelike dungeons got their start using just ASCII, but the artist's style is a real part of this game. You don't yes. have this game without Ko uh, Kovalik's uh, style. No, totally agree. Now, after my first couple plays, I found it fascinating how much thought you have to put in the path drawing phase. 
Like that is not just a quick, simple draw a path, hit all the monsters or run right to the exit. Like you need to look at how the player laid out the dungeon. Think about where your opponent's likely to put treasure. Look at their upgrades. That is big. If you notice they haven't upgraded those, those goblins, you might want to try to hit every one. Goblins only hit on a double 10 without buffs. Um, you basically need to do a risk assessment, right? How many monsters do you think I can hit? Like, should I sit there and kill everything I can? Should I do the math? Like, I have 20 hit points. If every, everything hits me, I'm only going to take 19 damage max. I'm perfectly safe. Or do you push it and go, well, I'm going to, the goblins will probably die. Like, that's a part of this game. And like, risk assessment is something I talk about at work. It's not something I usually think about in my board games. Now, as with any dungeon crawl, the dice will impact your success or failure. Yeah, that is the one thing I think some gamers aren't going to like and others are going to love, the random element the dice add to this game. Now, I will say I do greatly appreciate it's two dice. So you do have a bell curve there. You're not just doing a linear thing. It could have easily went, this is a D&D &D type game. Let's throw in a D20. I am so glad it's 2D10 because then I can do that math, right? I know the average roll is and what the, the odds are of what I'm going to roll. And I do appreciate that. And I got to say, having a combat role in a dungeon crawling game just makes sense. So I got to say, it can be frustrated when you're fully leveled up dragon, even though you've got a hand of four fire breath cards and you still die because you rolled double ones. Or actually, a four fire breath wouldn't do it. That actually gives you 20. But let's say you had three fire breath cards and a fully leveled up dungeon. So it, 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 there's more there and some people are going to like it and some aren't. Now, this randomness is something else you have to consider when plotting those paths, right? What are the odds the goblins are going to hit? And another thing that I hadn't mentioned yet is remembering what cards your opponent drafted. Do they even have any Fire Breath cards in their deck to buff those dragons? Were you paying attention or were you too busy drawing walls? It's a little odd to have a game that honestly is all about strategy. It's all about planning ahead. Your first card is going to impact your last turn. Throwing in a random element so prominently in the resolution part of the game, it's kind of weird. Like, it, it feels unbalanced, though it fits the theme. Again, if you're DMing an RPG and you put all that thought into your dungeon, and then these heroes come in with dice to ruin it. Though I will yeah. say, if you can't mitigate the dice to some degree, that is frustrating. Although it seems like the cards can certainly help yes. you out. Yeah, that's what the cards are for. The cards are really to mitigate that randomness. But then if all you drafted were healing potions for the other player's heroes, you're going to have to be stuck with what you roll. So again, it's a lot going on here. And I think that's clear at this point, right? Like the, there is a lot of depth to Doodle Dungeon. It's called Doodle Dungeon. It's a flipping right. You just don't expect this. There is a lot to think about in every aspect of this game. And that keeps players engaged right from the start. The downfall of all of this, though, is how long it takes. Like for our group, Doodle Dungeon really skirts the border on overstaying its welcome, at least with the adults we played. Even knowing how long the game's going to be sitting down, the game can feel like it took up more time than you want it to. We sit down on date night to play this game, and a two-player, it even took us over an hour. While I have considered ways of speeding it up, like changing the icons or telling everyone, don't color in, don't draw eyes on your monsters. Even just doing that would speed it up. I haven't actually sat down and tried any of these. Now, where this is a problem is I have a large game collection. Not everyone does, right? When I'm sitting there going, you know what? I'm going to sit down and play a game for an hour and a half. What do I want to spend that time playing? Do I want to play this silly dungeon crawling game? Or am I going to play something with a little more meat to it? Because once you're up to an hour and a half, you can play some pretty heavy games. There's certainly a choice to be made. And the sort of gamer you are and the feeling mm -hmm. or lack thereof from this game is going to weigh heavily, especially if you didn't have a great experience the first time, yeah. getting it to the table again may prove difficult. Now, what I will say, and I, I specifically said the adults in our group, because my kids thought this game was the perfect length. The 14 drafting rounds gave them just enough time to fill their dragon and make it feel complete. And they really enjoyed playing through the resolution phase, the going around, what happened to your guy? What happened to this guy? Everyone was engaged, even though it's other players rolling the dice. And I was most surprised because my youngest stayed engaged the whole time. He's usually the one that wants to drop out after half an hour in most games. And she was perfectly played for this one right to the end. Uh, and for those who might not be regular listeners, your kids both love the yeah. artistic aspect of games. So I'm sure the graphical aspect helped keep them in touch. Yes, um, they had very themed dungeons. Uh, my daughter, Gwen, every orc was dressed in a different costume. 
and her, her dungeon was the dungeon costume party. So there was the metal orc and the pirate orc. And yes, that was all part of the game. The biggest one we, we had to implement the house rule. No adding flair to your dungeon unless another player is still drawing. So as soon as everyone's flipped their card down there, it's done drawing, you stop adding flair. And then we draw the new cards and we draft, which which I think is probably going to be a common rule. Um, my youngest daughter had a Christmas theme. All of her, her her pit traps were all Christmas trees and all the walls had lights on them. So yes, oh. that, that my kids did get into that. And yes, I had to enforce the, no, Gwen's done drawing. We're going to sweat the next round of cards. Now, overall, Doodle Dungeon is a really engaging, highly strategic dungeon crawling game that does a great job of making you feel like a dungeon overlord, a dungeon architect. It's a lot of fun drawing the dungeon as well as determining the hero's path for one of your opponents. That final resolution system is fun to run through and does feel like you're playing a fantasy RPG. It feels like you're playing a series of fantasy RPG combats and falling into traps and all that stuff, especially with the use of the dice. And at the end of the game, I always feel like I, I made something. Look, I drew a dungeon, check out my dungeon, and everyone wants to see my dungeon. And I enjoy looking back to see what I did wrong. I also like looking at my opponent's dungeon to see how I could have drawn a better path. My only issue with this game is the length, which is just longer than you would expect and moves this game firmly out of the quick filler game into something longer. And the problem is with something longer, it now has to complete with a plethora of other games. It will be interesting to see if this comes out in a digital version in one form or another uh, to help uh, help that along. I could totally see playing this, like like the Guild of Dungeoneering, that which we gave away a copy of, reminds me of this game. I can totally see click to place walls, dragging things over. Um, honestly, there might be one out there because it wouldn't surprise me because this, I think, would lend itself to digital very well. One other thing I probably should have noted that it didn't come up is this is four player only, which is actually different for many roll and rights and many flip and rights. You can play any number of players, like some are up to like 990 players, as long as everyone's got a sheet. But note in this game, because of the size of the deck, you are limited to four players exactly. You can play less. You need at least two because the drawing the path thing doesn't work with just playing solo. It is up to four players. You're going to, but no more, right? Like I said, many flip and roll and rights. And this is not one of those games where one card comes up and everyone has to use it. Now, maybe someone wants to come up with a variant rule that might work, but as it stands, two to four players. So if the theme appeals to, if you dig reverse dungeon crawlers, if you like building dungeons and filling them with monsters and traps, I think this game is definitely worth checking out. I am very happy to add it to my collection, my growing reverse dungeon crawl collection. I mean, I need a shelf of them eventually. Just know that going in, this is not a quick game, and it's all about learning and uh, exploiting is possibly the wrong word, but taking advantage of the rule intricacies and using those to your advantage. If you're looking for a fun, silly dungeon romp filled with stabbing your friends in the back and tons of laughs, this isn't the game for you. While the game features a silly theme, silly flavor text and fantastic John Kovalik art. It's just not the light romp you might expect it to be. Now, where I think this game may have a market is a group that probably wouldn't even give it a look. And that is the medium weight Euro fans. While the theme and art style suggest this to be an Amerithrash adventure game, the feature, it features a lot of strategy, tactics, and difficult player decision points. I think Euro fans may dig this, regardless of its dice-driven combat system and adventure theme. And just a note, the designer of this game is actually the same designer as the from the Minecraft Builders and Biomes, which is another I game, the name. which is another game that is deceptively thinky. Um, yes. You know, for Minecraft, people think of it as a kid's game. That game as well had a lot of decision points in it mm -hmm. and was... Uh, a much beefier game than we had expected initially when we uh, got our hands on it. Well, you agree. Review on YouTube and the blog. Well, that's it for our review of Doodle Dungeon. Have you played this one? Let us know what you think about it in the comments. We welcome, also welcome you, you to check the more detailed written review over at tabletopbellhop.com.